Get ready to step into scripture with Tina. Hey everyone, welcome to Step Into Scripture. My name is Tina Wilson. I'm a pastor's wife and a mom of seven. Alongside my husband, Matt, I've committed my life to serving King Jesus as a church planter, a Bible teacher, an author, and an advocate for all-in family ministry. I'm passionate about making Christ and His church famous and about helping people develop a commitment to reading God's whole word, Genesis to Revelation. That's the point of this podcast, to help people in that commitment. And so in this season, season two, we've committed to answer whatever Bible questions listeners and viewers submit to us mm-hmm. as they're reading God's word. And this has given us some cool opportunities. Yeah. We've gotten to talk about some weighty topics, questions that deal with the character of God. Why does he do the things that he does? Right. We've dealt with some really obscure references in the Bible, mm-hmm. things that that you have to have the whole thing to even find an answer to. Right. Questions that can't be answered with just standalone passages. So great conversations we've had over these last 18 episodes in this season. But today's question is a really practical one. Right. So I'm excited that we get to share both from scripture and from some personal testimony. The question we're answering today is, should I practice fasting? Mm-hmm. So to kick us off, I want to just lay a foundation by defining biblical fasting. Fasting is the spiritual discipline of abstaining from food or drink or perhaps some other means of personal gratification in order to fully, sacrificially, and humbly dedicate ourselves to seeking the Lord in a particular matter. Mm -hmm. So that's our definition we're working with. And Stacey, if you will, introduce yourself and go ahead and give us the biblical purpose of fasting. Yes. Like Tina said, welcome back. My name is Stacey Vines. Um, Both my husband and I are small business owners and nonprofit founders here in our community. Together, we are also a church plant family here at Ecclesia. And reading the Bible from start to finish has certainly been a banner that I have flown in my life personally and through the women's ministry here at Ecclesia. And so stepping through all of these conversations with you guys and my sister Tina has been an absolute joy and a pleasure uh, to be a part of. And this topic is no different, uh, one that we can certainly uh, together have spent and could spend hours yeah. talking through. Um, personally, we've both participated in fast together um, at the same time for the same purposes, unified in that. So to have this conversation and to step through scripture about this topic, something that is personally significant in my life, um, is certainly a pleasure, and I am happy to be uh, the one to introduce it. So Tina has tasked me with introducing uh, the biblical purpose behind fasting. So to get us started, like we do every week, we will use as much scripture as possible so that scripture can interpret and speak for itself. We're going to begin um, in the book of Isaiah. Uh, chapter 58, and this is a chapter meant to rebuke Israel for going through the religious motions, just going through the day-to-day, something that I know every person listening or watching can identify with. Life is busy. We have families. We have work. We have ministry. We have many things that can distract us and cause us to become complacent, numb, and just go through the motions. And so that's the context of the audience of this letter. So we can identify with that uh, easily. Uh, But these uh, in this season, Israel's heart was not submitted fully to God out of love for God. And so we'll pick up Isaiah 58 verses three and four. We're at the beginning. God is kind of calling out this cry that Israel has lifted up to him. He says, why have we fasted? They say, and you have not seen it. Why have we humbled ourselves? And you have not noticed Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Mm. So immediately there out of God's response, we learn from that passage that fasting is not a part of our religious checklist. Right. It's not an item um, that we can say, okay, I have fasted this day. Check. Uh, Because clearly Israel is being rebuked by God for treating it that way as as something that was just a a part of life, a part of their relationship, something that could just be stepped over and set to the side. It has to be accompanied by righteousness, justice, and peace. And at the end there of verse 4, we see the reason of why. God says, 
so that our voice would be heard on high. So something we can attest to, when we abstain from food, this mm-hmm. fulfillment, this, this gratification, we uh, ast- abstain from fellowship with other people, and we redirect that time towards worship and prayer, that is not only uh, more fulfilling, but it requires something out of us. It requires our intentionality. So we want you to think of it like this. Both eating and prayer are things that we do on autopilot. Sure. I definitely do this on autopilot. I'll be making dinner or packing a lunch or just walking through the kitchen and somehow a cheese stick is in my hand and I'm eating it as I'm walking and cooking or I'm taking a bite of whatever I'm making for one of our children. Uh, We all can do that, right? It's something that we just might find ourselves doing out of habit. And in the same way, we can hit autopilot in our walk with Jesus, specifically in our prayer time where we have this habit, more of a habitual prayer where we wake up in the morning and we pray, or before we go to bed, we pray, or before we eat, we pray. And our prayers tend to begin and stay in this uh, copy and paste mode of, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. I have done that. I have, I have had to uh, correct my children for doing that, falling in that same pattern. Yeah. We're a family that prays before we eat. We always ask, who wants to pray for our meal? They raise their hands and they begin with, Heavenly Father, thank you for my family and friends. And we're like, pause, have a, have a unique conversation with yeah. God um, that, is, that is way more real uh, and has more, more meat to it. So fasting is something that happens outside of our routine. Yes. It's something that takes an intentional time. It takes planning. It takes preparation. And it requires us to turn our focus away from physical fulfillment that we get from food or fellowship or whatever it is that we have given up um, in this act of fasting. And it it causes us to focus on our spiritual needs. Uh, the, the more hungry you become... <laughs> the more intentional you are in asking God to bring that satisfaction by himself, uh, that closeness and connection with him versus that, that immediate remedy of food that you could easily go and go and get. But that connection with God is making our voice heard on high as we cry out to him. So we're making that trade off. We talked last week in episode 18, why could Isaac not reverse the blessing? We noted that Esau traded his spiritual inheritance, his spiritual connection to the the plan and purpose that God had for him for a meal, for a worldly moment of fulfillment. So when we enter into a time of fasting and we do give up food, that is the reversal of that. Right. That's our putting aside the worldly so that we can focus on a connection with God with the intent of making our voice heard on high. Um, so that's just something to kind of recall the, the, the truths that we learned about last week. But just to continue back in God's rebuke that we are reading from in the book of Isaiah, uh, verse five there in chapter 58, it says, is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it not only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? So we've already read and and understood the truth that when we are fasting, when we're trading this physical fulfillment for a deeper connection with God, that we are intending to have our voice heard by God with the intent of him drawing near and bringing that satisfaction. Later in his rebuke, we, we learn the truth that it's also to humble ourselves. God wants to draw near to those who are humble in heart. As Isaiah describes here, when people wanted to express repentance or brokenness or a time of mourning and lament in the Bible, they would put on ashes uh, onto their heads. They would tear their clothes. They would sit in sackcloth. They would intentionally lower themselves to an uncomfortable place yeah. in order to humble themselves. And, and what they're communicating through that physical act is that I am powerless to fix my own problems. I don't have a solution yeah. to my situation or the situation of our people. I can't deal with this difficulty. I need discernment. I need direction. I need you to rescue me. God, intervene. God, please give an answer. It's a call through humility to have our voice 
heard on right. high. So here are the two reasons that will lay the foundation for the rest of our conversation as to why biblical fasting, uh, the purpose behind biblical fasting, to make voices heard on high, right? Calling out to God. And it is very, I can attest, the, the more hungry uh, I, exp- the more hunger I feel, the harder I cry out yes. to God for his connection and satisfaction. And then second, to humble ourselves before the Lord. So as such, we want to note these two specific applications with these principles. First, the purpose of fasting is to make our voice heard on high. Then obviously fasting without prayer is not really fasting. That's right. a diet. Right. That has no spiritual value. The idea is that in the time that we are sacrificing physically, that we would be trading that um, for a deeper connection with God in prayer. So as our physical strength wears down, and it does, our reliance on God for his fulfillment and satisfaction intensifies. Yes. So like the, re- the rebuke that we just read in Isaiah 58, there's a similar re- rebuke that we can draw truth from and principles um, in this conversation from the book of Zechariah. So we're going to pop over there to the seventh chapter. We're going to read verses four through six. It says, then the word of the Lord Almighty came to me, ask all the people of the land and the priest. Here's the, here's the question. When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, seventh months for the past 70 years, was it really for me that you fasted? And when you were eating and drinking, were you not just feasting for yourselves? God is asking a question here about the heart and the why and the purpose behind a fast or a feast, Yes. right? So like Isaiah's audience, Zachariah's hearers were also, had also fasted. And while they were doing it, they were neglecting justice and mercy. So in their hearts, their motives and their actions uh, were contrary to what we've now learned the purpose of fasting is to have our voice heard on high and to be humble before the Lord. Zechariah, though, points us towards an obvious truth. And here's what it says. When we eat and drink, we feast for ourselves. By the contrast, when we fast, we should do that for God. In feasting, we please ourselves by gratifying the need for, f- for our flesh, which is the need of food and sus- substance. But in fasting, we please God, not ourselves, by expressing to him that our need for him is greater than our physical provisions that we can yeah. provide for ourselves. So another important application that we need to see uh, that relates to this conversation in seeking humility through fasting, um, you know, we noted That in the Old Testament, when people would fast, they would put on sackcloth, they would sit in ashes, they'd put ashes on their forehead, they would tear their clothes, and we read the Lord's rebuke to them, right? By making a spectacle of their fasting, they were actually accomplishing the exact opposite of the purpose intended in fasting, which is to humble themselves. Instead, they were elevating themselves by making it very well known that I am participating in this act of fasting. Jesus rebuked this in the New Testament also. And we're going to read two passages from Jesus' teaching. One is on fasting and one is on prayer. Because when we talk about fasting, true fasting is accompanied by intentional and deep prayer. Yeah. Because again, remember, if, fa- if we're not fasting and praying, we're just on a diet, okay? Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 8. It says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling on like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. So there's one piece when we talk about praying and being humble and not, uh, not praying for the external gratification of what someone sees us doing or someone's opinion of what we're doing. Uh, Jesus says, rather, do this in, in the inner room, right? Do this in secret where your father is and you will be rewarded. 
We see also in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 to 18, here Jesus is talking about fasting. And he says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full, right? The attention and the the opposite of humility is what their reward was, and they've received it in full. Yeah. Uh, but when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen. Sound familiar? And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So there are two strong reminders of God's character um, to us by Jesus. And the reminder that when we are fasting, you know, put your makeup on, yeah. wash your face, brush your hair. Uh, you don't have to um, disfigure yourself or draw attention to your fast because remember that's opposite of the intended purpose, yeah. which is to be humble and to have our voices heard by God. Um, that's an intimate one-on-one -on -one that doesn't include the attention or the right. opinion of anyone outside of you and God. So for clarity here, this doesn't mean that your fasting is null and void if someone else finds out. Right. Right. In truth, most of us, and this is something I've really had to reckon with in my exercise and my learning of fasting as an adult uh, follower of Jesus, but we don't necessarily live in a, in a time where we can isolate ourselves and sit in ashes like King David did. We talked about that right. right before we got started on this episode. We don't really have that ability to do that. And many, uh, many of you listening, or I know it's true for us with young children, uh, or, you know, you're, you're in a marriage, someone in your house needs to know that you are fasting. Yes. <laughs> um, because not only, uh, do you need an accountability and someone to support you and encourage you, but to pray for you, yeah. um, in that, in that space while you're doing that, um, you know, to prepare and, uh, help you with the things, the tasks that you're still responsible for something so beautiful, uh, about us even having this conversation this week, uh, just last week, my mother and I were talking about fasting mm -hmm. and, you know, we went through a lot of the accounts that we're going to talk about here. And we sat, um, in this conversation and she had no idea that I was actually fasting at the time. Wow. Um, I was on day one of a two day prepared plan fast that you and I participated yes. in together for a particular purpose, um, for a particular time frame. but she was questioning me on not questioning me on, on the validity of fasting, but she recognized over time that she had been praying and praying and humbly, you know, reading the word of God every day, but still feeling like the connection with God was dim. Mm. And in her own mind from reading the Bible, she questioned, should I fast? Right. But she had never been instructed by a teacher or, or a preacher to actually fast. Right. She actually been instructed that it was a practice that was no longer necessary. And, and I think we're going to get through some of that in our time together in this conversation, but I was able to share with her, you know, the beautiful times in my life where in denying physical fulfillment, um, it has, it has strengthened not only my relationship with God, but like we just talked about bringing others in on that, knowing, you know, letting them know I'm fasting and having them pray for me or yes. with me, maybe not fast with me, but pray with me and for me has strengthened even my earthly relationships yeah. that are going to transcend into eternity. That's right. right? Yeah. Um, and so just, you know, a short testimony for me, um, in, in a time of fasting, when I have questioned or in a time of uncertainty or unclear, not, not being clear on something, I've, I've sometimes questioned, should I fast? Um, and if you question it, you should do it. Yeah. Um, because I, we, are, we are built to be close with God physically and spiritually. And our physical closeness with God is temporarily uh, on hold yes. until he returns. But I want to know his presence. I want to be intimate with him. So when he comes, I'm not figuring him out for the first time. There's nothing I want more than to be ready, looking up, 
and to see him coming. And fasting is a discipline that reminds me that perfection is my end game. Yeah. And that peace that I find with God when I am fasting and connected with him is, is the closest thing that I can get a, a small taste that tells me heaven is worth the trade every day when I give up myself and I give up worldly satisfaction uh, it, it's, it's worth the trade. And I get a glimpse of that in my times of fasting. And we need that reminder, right? Yeah. Like the Hebrew writer wouldn't have talked about it like he did with Esau, like we talked about last week, if we didn't need to be reminded mm -hmm. that, that our inclination is toward yes. godlessness and immorality that puts physical pleasure and gratification in front of the eternal inheritance. Mm -hmm. We've got to keep that in the forefront of our minds. And fasting is is probably... The most powerful way to do that. It is a very powerful uh, resource because God doesn't, he, he never disappoints. And, and sometimes um, when I'm fasting, I'll even think to myself, you know, this, this experience, right? Like I'm not after a euphoric high or an emotional climax. I, I don't want to paint that picture, but, and it's, it is the most um, real life definition of peace and rest that I cannot, I can't use our language to describe. Right. It's not an, even an emotion. Right. Um, and so I don't want to paint the picture that we're after a, an emotional experience or a, you know, a, some sort of spiritual high that we conjure up. That, that's not at all what I'm, I want to express, but it is, it is an intention. Um, it is an intentional seeking after being at peace and rest with God, um, you know, this side of his return until paradise is yes. our reality. And that is why I count fasting apart from the, the, the biblical, beautiful truth that we know, right. Mm -hmm. That we can step through and we're about to, yeah. uh, my own experience in that is true and, and it will just always be true. So intent is key. We, we talked about, um, you know, going to God to make our voice heard on high in a particular matter. We recently fasted over a particular yes. matter. Yes. And in that, this is not a, a moment to plug self-righteousness, but in that praying in this room together, uh, it would have been pointless for us to pray any other prayer than in this matter, God, let your will yes. be done and give us the courage to be content with whatever you decide. But please just give an answer. Yeah. The intent behind the fast really matters, right? Because we are not here to control a God who is in control. Right. Right. It's not that you have to be sure when you're fasting that no one knows that you're fasting, but he wants you to not seek that as your reward uh, the way that the Pharisees did. Right. And we're going to talk about all that. I'm getting ahead of myself because I get excited. Fasting is only nullified if it's done for your own righteousness, right? If it's done while neglecting righteousness, justice, and mercy like we saw in Zechariah, or if it's done in an attempt to try to control God or to uh, bring self-gratification and self-righteousness to yourself. So Tina, you're going to give us a quick review, and then we're going to step through a ton of scripture to really let this beautiful discipline uh, expose itself. And so if you've never explored this, get ready. You're going to want to fast when this is over. So let's go I ahead and step so. through I it. I hope that is, that is the next step. I hope so too. After people listen to this. So just a review, we've got a definition of fasting. It's the spiritual discipline of abstaining from food or drink or perhaps some other means of personal gratification to fully sacrificially and humbly dedicate ourselves to seeking the Lord in a particular matter. That's the definition. Right. Two purposes of fasting yep. that you've brought to the forefront here to humble ourselves and to make our voices heard on high. Right. Those are the two reasons. And then two instructions mm -hmm. that you brought out for fasting. It's to be accompanied by prayer and it's not to be done for personal glory or attention. Right. So we've got a definition, two purposes and two instructions. And now we're going to dig into biblical accounts of fasting and I hope you'll just grab something to write down some references because I want to start by just giving you several Old Testament accounts. There's so many that we can't go through them all here, but you can write these down and go back and read them later for yourselves. Mm -hmm. In the Old Testament, some people fasted for repentance. Right. So you can read about that in 1 Samuel 7, 6. 
where the Israelites fasted as a way of turning away from foreign gods and turning back to the Lord. You can read Nehemiah 9, 1 and 2. There the Israelites fasted and confessed their sins once all the foreigners were removed from the community. And you can read Jonah 3, 4 through 9. There the Ninevites fasted when they learned that their city was going to be overturned in 40 days right. if they didn't repent. So that's fasting for repentance. We also see in the Old Testament, people fasted to express mourning, which you've already leaned mm -hmm. into, Stacy. You can read 1 Samuel 31, 12. When Saul and his sons were killed in battle, the men of Jabesh Gilead fasted. And then in 2 Samuel 1, 12, David and his men fasted when they learned about Saul's death. Some people in the Old Testament fasted because they were in danger. Judges 20, 26, there the Israelites fought against the tribe of Benjamin. And despite having more soldiers, they were losing. So they went back to their camp mm -hmm. and they fasted and they wept. And the result was that the Lord defeated the Benjamites. Right. Ezra 8, 21 through 23, there a fast was proclaimed prior to the people's return journey from Babylon to Judea when they mm -hmm. were coming out of exile. In Nehemiah 1, 4, Nehemiah fasted when he heard that the gates of Jerusalem had been destroyed and the captives were in danger. In Esther 4, 3, when Haman's decree was to kill the Jews and that reached the provinces of the king, there was mourning and fasting for the protection of the Jews right. because they were in danger. And then in Esther 4, 16, Esther herself was about to risk her life and go before the king and uh, seek an audience with him. So she proclaimed a three-day fast for all the Jews living in Susa at the time. Then in Joel 1, 13 through 15, Joel, a prophet, talked about the day of the Lord that would bring destruction, and his audience was told to lament and to sanctify a fast. Mm -hmm. So those are just several examples of three Old Testament reasons we find people fasting to express repentance, to express mourning, or because they were in danger. So obviously, there are plenty of examples in the Old Testament right. that you can go back here and read about people fasting. Um, but I want us to look at one in particular. This is one of my favorite fasting accounts in Scripture. I think it's so powerful. And just like those that we just referenced, this was a fast for protection and victory in the face of danger. Right. And it's found in 2 Chronicles 20. So that's where we're going to land. Jehoshaphat here was one of the kings of ancient Israel's southern kingdom who really tried to fight follow God. Yeah. And in 2 Chronicles 19 and 20, there's this amazing account of reforms that he brought um, in Judah that led to victories. He set up judges who were accountable to the chief priest, and he gave these instructions in 2 Chronicles 19.10. In every case that comes before you from your people who live in the cities, whether bloodshed or concerns of the law, commandments, decrees, or regulations, you are to warn them not to sin against the Lord. Otherwise, his wrath will come on you and your people. Do this, and you will not sin. Mm -hmm. So Jehoshaphat got very serious about moving people closer to God, and when he did that, then attacks ensued. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I want to just mention that because that's a pattern that's still true for us today as we're talking about fasting in the face of danger. Right. When we make intentional efforts like we see here to pursue godliness and to turn people toward God, we are going to be met with spiritual opposition. Yeah. And so sometimes our fast is not in response to a physical danger that's sure. in front of us, but a spiritual danger, spiritual warfare that we're fasting. In Judah's case here, where Jehoshaphat was king, the attack did come in a physical form, mm -hmm. and here it was the Moabites and the Ammonites. Right. So as Jehoshaphat is working to turn this nation back toward God, some people came and told him, Second Chronicles 20, verse 2, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already at Hazazon Tamar, that is in Gedi. So Jehoshaphat is leading this response now mm -hmm. for the nation that's going to instruct us in how we need to respond to spiritual warfare, to mm -hmm. attacks that come against us when we get serious about God. Yeah. And it's going to happen. If Satan is leaving you alone. You got a problem. You got a problem. Right. Maybe he doesn't see you as a threat. So when he sees you as a threat, mm -hmm. he's going to attack. And here's the response we see that Jehoshaphat leads in. Second Chronicles 20 verses 3 and 4. Alarmed, yeah. Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. So when we fast in a way that is acceptable to God, which you just stepped mm -hmm. us through in Isaiah and in Zechariah, which is fasting that's accompanied with 
repentance, yes. prayer, and a pursuit of righteousness, then like Jehoshaphat and Judah, here's what Isaiah 58, 14 says, then you will find your joy in the mm -hmm. Lord and I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land and feast on the inheritance of your father, Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Mm -hmm. So that's right from that chapter you started us out right. in. And in other words, the account of Jehoshaphat is a truth for all people. Biblical fasting leads to victory, mm -hmm. but like you said, it can't be because we're trying to prompt God right. to do what we want him to do. Right. Our fasting has to align with his plan mm -hmm. and with his word. So in their prayer and fasting, the people of Judah, they claim the promises of God mm -hmm. that he had made in his covenant that he had established with their ancestor Solomon at the dedication of the temple. Right. And I want to just read that. Second Chronicles 20, verse 9, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. Right. So that's what the people are saying in Jehoshaphat's day. And that's exactly what Solomon proclaimed when the temple was dedicated. Yep. That was a promise from God that if they would come to him, he would answer. Mm -hmm. So they align their fast with God's indisputable word. Mm -hmm. which is a huge lesson for us. Right. Man, we need to learn to pray the promises of God. Absolutely. And so I want to just share a quick testimony here about a miraculous fasting event that stands out as, as just a, a landmark moment in my life. Like if I had a wrestling with God moment like mm -hmm. Jacob, this was this it. it. Yeah. So a couple of years ago, our home church, Ecclesia, had the opportunity to purchase a large building and it was going to give us more seating, which we needed because our building was packed, still is. And the purpose in it was God honoring. Mm -hmm. We wanted to make more space for the church mm -hmm. to grow. And we know that's what God wants. Mm -hmm. um, any kingdom, the purpose of the king is to expand his domain. Yeah. And that's what we were looking to do. But the opportunity that was presented to us to purchase this building carried some great risk for a few reasons. Um, number one, the condition of the building sure. was not what we had hoped and, and believed it was mm -hmm. when we initially were presented with it. And also because the whole transaction was just shrouded in a lot of confusion because yeah. there was just a lot of conflicting information yeah. that surrounded the sale of the property. So this Christian extension fund entered into a provisional contract to purchase the building from mm -hmm. a mainline denomination. And if they purchased it, then they would have given our home church, Ecclesia, the opportunity to buy it from them. Right. And that's where we were sitting. And then I was appointed to oversee the due diligence inspections to reveal the condition of the building, mm -hmm. which again, turned out to be problematic right? because um, the buyer had offices that were 1,800 miles away. So I'm acting on their behalf. This was such a daunting task yeah. because of the size of the building mm -hmm. and because of the scope of the problems with the facility and also because of just all the inconsistencies that continued to arise mm -hmm. from conversations surrounding the sale. So it was just a, a season where I felt like I was climbing a mountain trying to accomplish a task yeah. that was very confusing yeah. and, and, and somewhat conflictual. So when the inspections were done and I had finished that task, I submitted all the reports to the buyer. And then I was so confused and conflicted over the matter. Yeah. I needed clarity in a particular situation. So I made a commitment to God mm -hmm. that I was going to fast. I was going to eat no food. For 10 days. Well, and at the time it wasn't even 10 days. Yeah. It was just an open ended, like, yeah. which <laughs> who knew how long this could have drawn out. And, and I guess God, you know, knew how long I could last. Right. But my commitment was I was only going to drink water until one of two things happened mm -hmm. until either the buyer of the building who now had all these due diligence reports with mm -hmm. all this mess that had been uncovered until the buyer either terminated the contract. Mm -hmm. Or until the buyer released the contingencies on the contract, which would have moved the sale to close. Right. Because I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what God was looking to do here. So every single day of the fast, you talked about aligning it with prayer. Mm -hmm. I would go to this building, which was the location of the, the subject of the fast, uh -huh. and I would pray. And, and cry out to God, marching around this place like Jericho, yeah. like, God, we just need a clear answer from you. 
And I do not claim to have any kind of apostolic gifting sure. to hear from God audibly. Oh, we've clearly dispelled that. Right. Yeah. And like we've expressed here, I'm mm-hmm. quite skeptical of anyone who does make those claims. But on day 10 of what was an open-ended fast, yeah. I'm not going to break it until God answers. Uh-huh. I'm that committed right. to my voice being heard on high yep. and to getting clarity on day 10. I knew when I got up that morning that I was going to get the answer that I was waiting on. Didn't know what the answer was going to be. I just know I was going to get it. And I I can't say how I knew Mm -hmm. other than I was just in a space of complete physical depletion. Uh And I had the ability to hear from God maybe more clearly than I ever have in Mm -hmm. my life. Mm -hmm. And, And it could not have been clearer than if someone had audibly said, right, you're going to get a phone call with an answer today. Right. And it was so clear that I even said it to my daughters who were at home with me. I mean, I can remember the exact place I was standing in my bedroom when I knew it. Yeah. And I said, I'm going to break this fast today because we're going to get the answer. And, and very shortly after I knew that, and I said that, it happened. Yeah. I received a phone call and it was the CEO of the organization who was purchasing the building, which, which that in itself, I don't even know why he would not have called someone else. Right. There were many other people involved in this deal, but he called me and he gave me the answer. Right. And then I had it and it wasn't the answer that looked favorable. The answer was no and not yes. The answer was we're going to uh, break the contract Mm -hmm. because of all of this confusion that had surrounded the whole thing. And so before I broke the fast, I went back to the building, which was the place that I had walked around for these nine previous days. And I just spent some time praising God that he had given an answer, even though it didn't feel like Uh the favorable answer. And that's a whole other story because the turnaround to that is it sure was a favorable answer. It was. And it took a a little bit of time for us to see God's favor Mm -hmm. in it, but it's very, very apparently displayed today, um, physically right here where we're sitting, Mm -hmm. actually. Um, But the point I want to make is at the end of a fast, and as we fast, Mm -hmm. there needs to be an element of worship in it too. So I want to read you 2 Chronicles 20, verses 21 and 22. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him Mm -hmm. for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. And as they begin to sing and praise, all right, now Mm -hmm. get this, they prayed, they fasted, and as they begin to worship, yeah. the Lord set ambushes against the man of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. Yep. So let's just walk through the, the actions that were taken in line with this fast from Second Chronicles chapter 20. They turned to God in verse 4. In verse 9, they prayed and they claimed his promises. Mm -hmm. In verse 3, they fasted. In verses 21 and 22, they worshiped. And then God brought the victory. So my my fasting experience that I've just described, it brought an answer from God. Like I said, not the answer I was seeking. The answer was no and not yes. But here's where the victory was. God saved our church yeah. from buying a huge building two months before churches all over the country right. were mandated to stop meeting right. because of COVID. And that would have been a terrible time mm-hmm. to have a second mortgage mm-hmm. on a building that we couldn't even use. So that's one huge mm-hmm. victory that became immediate, almost immediately right. apparent. Another victory is that the very process of our walking out that due diligence led directly to an offer that our church received just eight months later to purchase the neighboring two properties, one of those that we're Mm -hmm. sitting in right here, right now, which was a much more favorable location and much better suited to the needs of our congregation. Right. And then the purchase of those two buildings that that were basically the replacement Uh for that one not only gave us more ministry space, uh, but also gave us land that our church needed to build roads, yes, because, which, our, mm-hmm. which our church needed, yep. right? Because we, we had this landlocked situation and the building of those roads led to our city uh-huh. approving us to build onto our existing worship center, mm-hmm. 
a much larger worship center mm-hmm. that's that's what we needed in the first place. Right. right. That was the whole reason that we first agreed to even look at that. Yeah, I agree. And so it was an indirect route uh-huh. to a victory. And, you know, sometimes I wonder what might have looked different if fasting had been subtracted from the equation. Yeah. Because I wasn't the only one fasting. I and was I wasn't definitely the only one praying. In Disney, I remember clearly the phone call from you. Yeah. Um, that you had spoken with the buyer. Mm-hmm. I was walking around the, the rim of the pool where we were because I was only eating vegetables <laughs> in Disney World. <laughs> On, and so I was very ready for our fast to come to an yes. end and, um, and, and had gotten, uh, really, uh, learned the lesson in that, uh, that, that I now walk by, uh, every day in, in life and in business and, and in ministry, God bless it or burn it. Uh, because I was just so ready for him to yes. just give an answer, yes. um, bless it or burn it either way, uh, we'll take it. Um, but I remember very clearly getting that call from you and us both going, but he gave an answer. He gave an answer. Well, and even this morning, we've had a conversation mm-hmm. where I said, that was such an impactful event in uh-huh. my life that it has continued to affect even, even a, an opportunity that is set in front of us right now as we're sitting here. Mm-hmm. And it taught me a different way to walk it out. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you, man, the truth I got from it more than anything is when we want clarity, yeah. when we want to hear from God, like maybe we've never heard from him before, mm-hmm. depleting ourselves physically through fasting is a path to that discernment. Right. Yeah. And, and what we learn from this account that we read of Jehoshaphat in Second Chronicles is here's the pattern, repentance plus prayer plus fasting plus worship Mm -hmm. equals victory, even if it's a different answer than what you thought. Yeah. There's victory in it. Well, because he gave an answer. Yes. That is the victory. Yes. Right? Not that we're aiming to prompt him. Right. But but the victory is that God wants to speak to us. Yes. He wants to be near to us. And this is our path towards that. This is a piece of that. So, you know, we've definitely seen audacious moves of God following times of prayer and fasting when they are coupled together. You know, Tina, you mentioned uh, before you referenced the narrative about fasting from Ezra and Nehemiah. You know, the same thing is true here. God has done major kingdom work in response to humility and to fasting, Ecclesia was born out of prayer meetings. Yes. Right? Out yes. of fasting of, of, of unified individuals seeking to come close to God, to be heard by God, and to hear from God. When King Artaxerxes uh, sent Ezra from Babylon to Jerusalem, the prophet there gathered all of the Israelites who would go with him, and then he proclaimed a fast so that He might humble himself so that they might humble themselves before God and ask him for a safe journey. Before Ezra was sent on that journey, he had already testified to the king about God's protection, about his provisions for his people. He's already put God on this big pedestal in front of this king. So Ezra's trip back to to Jerusalem, he knew would be a dangerous one. And military escorts would have been a really nice security feature on that trip. But because he was standing on the, on the faith that he had already testified yes. about, Ezra chose, rather than seeking the protection from the world, he sought protection and provision from God over man. And at the beginning of Nehemiah, we read a similar account um, of them being sent to Jerusalem. Here, the cupbearer to the king in exile from Judah uh, hears about the ruin of Jerusalem and follows the same pattern um, as he saw and knew from Ezra. He first entered into a time of fasting and prayer before entering into the presence of the same king. Just as God honored Ezra's prayer of, of granting him provision and safety on his journey, he also honored 
that of the cupbearer. So God honored Nehemiah's prayer and fasting by moving the king to grant his request to return from Jerusalem with the intent of rebuilding. And here's what we read in Nehemiah uh, chapter two, verse eight. He says, and because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. So again, something noteworthy is the request and the desire that we read about in Nehemiah was aligned with God's plan. They were going to Jerusalem, not for self-gratification. They were going to rebuild uh, and reclaim the promise and the uh, instructions that God had given their ancestors. Both accounts involved audacious moves, knowing that God was able. Big tasks. So both of these accounts, Ezra, Nehemiah, they involved major moves, audacious moves faith moves, but they both happened knowing that God was able. Ezra's faith led him to not ask for that military escort, and Nehemiah's faith led him to ask for permission to go and for letters to the governors ordering a safe passage. Though they held positions in the king's court, one a teacher, one the cupbearer, both men were truly in, in, in who they truly were, were exiles. They were in a foreign land that was not their home. Both of these men stood before a king who had heard slander against their people. Both men feared the king, but their faith in God was greater than their fear of King Artaxerxes. They prayed and they fasted. They got, they honored God. And so God honored them and answered their audacious request with their physical need that they needed. We can learn from Ezra and Nehemiah's words and actions when our requests are intended to bring glory to God and to expand his territory, right? When it aligns with his purpose and plan. James chapter four, verses two and three. You don't have because you don't ask. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So James is cutting to the quick of the intention behind the prayer, something we started our conversation off with. We have the invitation to bring our requests to God directly. No mediator, nothing in between except God himself. And we can trust that he will answer and he will see our requests through when our intentions are meant for his glory and his gain. We will never know uh, the great kingdom impact that God has planned for our life unless we are willing to come to him in prayer, fasting, in faith, and in humility uh, to make our requests known to him. Let's see what God has for us. And I can attest that every big move that God has ever accomplished in and through my life, the life of our church, it was always preceded uh, by focused and fervent, intentional prayer and fasting. You know, we have to dare to believe that God can and will use all of us in his commission to participate in Jesus' restoration plan to make everything new, like we read um, in the culmination of things in Revelations chapter one. Something that I thought we would mention before we end our conversation you know, I, I, I gave a little piece of the conversation I had with my mom about fasting and, you know, it was kind of on the fly that she asked me just in a random phone call, you know, should I be fasting? And so I had to like, the the first thing that came to mind from scripture is the conversation that Jesus had about fasting with his disciples. And we would, we would, uh, we would be good to end on this note, right? When we fast, we humble ourselves, we bring our intent uh, before God. We want to align with him. We want to bring him glory and gain. Jesus uh, told his disciples, um, you know, when they asked him, why are we not fasting? Everyone's going to know we're not fasting. Yeah. When we were followers of John the Baptist, we fasted on a regular basis. The Pharisees and everyone, they fast on a regular basis, right? They're checking the box, right? We're not checking the box, Jesus. And he answers them and says, Basically, are you going to mourn while the bridegroom is with you? Right. But certainly there will come a time when you fast again. And so maybe this conversation about fasting is one that is unique to you because you've just assumed this is an Old Testament practice. I don't have to do this anymore. Uh, But just to button that, Jesus fasted. Yeah. He instructed uh, in his disciples to fast. But the point I think that Jesus was making when he when he mentions you don't have to mourn while you have the bridegroom while Jesus was with them 
their every spiritual and physical need was fulfilled. Yes. They were totally satisfied. They were at peace and at rest with the presence of God. Right. But now the bridegroom is, is we are awaiting him. Right. And so if we want to encounter uh, peace and rest, humility, uh, seeking righteousness, if we want that victory, all the things that we've talked about, yeah. our intention has to be, you know, until he returns, we want to fellowship with him. We yeah. want to hear from him. We want to be heard by him. And so if you're questioning, uh, if the question from, from the, if the submission of the submitting of the question was, should I be practicing fasting? Because I'm, is this a, a Christian checklist box that I need to be checking? Then no, that's not why that you shouldn't be practicing fasting for that. But if you want to await the return in a way in which Jesus himself says we await the return, then yes, we should be practicing yeah. fasting. We should be sharing the truth about yeah. fasting and we should, uh, we should count it as a joy in our life um, and share it with those around us who are far from Christ, even if they're in a relationship with Christ. Right. Uh, just like my mom who said, who I'm sure is listening to this because she follows this. She's stepping through scripture with your yeah. book, sends me notes every week. But if, if you're praying and you're questioning, should I be fasting? Because I just, I'm there, but I'm not quite there then the answer is yes, because yeah. until he returns, this is how we come into that connection with him uh, alongside a few other elements that we practice here at Ecclesia every single week. Uh, so we appreciate you guys stepping through scripture. If you haven't already picked up your copy of Step Into Scripture, you can you can grab that on Amazon. It's published by Renew.org. Um, and we just uh, couldn't be more thrilled to share our own testimonies about fasting thrilled that this question was even submitted um, and thrilled that scripture has so many truths to share with yes. us about it and why we should do it. So thank you all for joining us and we'll see you back next week. See ya.